Fourth and fifth graders, you guys are dismissed to Kids Church. If you have your Bible with you this morning, we continue in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 1. Uh, this morning we'll be in verses 18 through 23. As we begin, let's look at our memory verse for this section together. If you would, uh, please read it with me, starting with Romans 3, 22. It says, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Building suspense. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now these verses that we see in chapter 3, they are vital to what we're talking about this morning. Last week, we left off with... uh, The idea that God is, through Jesus Christ, both justifying us, that is, giving us a forgiveness that will last for eternity, and sanctifying us, that is, making us more like Jesus every day. That that is what faith produces in us. But now he's got to tell us why that's necessary. We can't understand the work of the gospel fully Until we understand our need for the gospel fully. And we understand that our justification, our being declared righteous, gives us freedom from death and hell. But can we truly understand what it means to be free from condemnation if we don't understand what led us to that in the first place? And that's Paul's thought here as he's writing this letter to the Romans. Remember, it's all about the gospel, right? So he, he has introduced the gospel. He's told us the work of the gospel. And now he's going to start telling us the need for the gospel. So we start this morning with Romans 1, 18. And in the NIV, it's not in there, but it is in the Greek. There's another one of those connector words. And so Basically, you read verse 17, it says the righteous will live by faith. And because of that, (coughs) as a consequence, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. What a fun verse to start with this morning, right? The wrath of God is being revealed. And, uh, you know, preachers for generations have been accused of, Hellfire and brimstone, right? Like we're going we're gonna to preach the wrath of God. We don't have a really good understanding of what God's wrath is really like. When we hear the word wrath, we hear uncontrolled anger, right? If we use that in context and I said, man, he really unleashed his wrath, you would think that someone just really got upset and just gave them both barrels, right? But the word there in the Greek for wrath, is not that image. It's the image of something that continues to fill up and fill up until it bursts. The imagery is almost like filling a balloon with helium and watching it expand and expand and expand and expand until finally it just can't take anymore and it pops. That's the image here. Is that God, in His great love for us, in His... His patience for us doesn't have an out-of-control anger, but an inner anger that just has burned to the place that something had to happen. And it is to our blessing and also sometimes to our detriment that God doesn't just give us like angry wrath, right? Like how easy would it be to know yes and no when every time we sin, God shoots us with a lightning bolt, right? Right? Or, hey, one, one mess up and you're done. And God just says, boom. But God in his great love for us doesn't unleash the kind of wrath that you and I unleash on each other. But in his patience and gentleness and mercy and self-control and all of the things that make him God, this Probably the best word is affront. This affront to his holiness cannot go unanswered. It has built to a place where 
the world living in rejection of God, of the things that contradict his holiness, demands a response. And the gospel is vital to us because we are deserving of wrath. I contribute, I am that unrighteousness, that godlessness. But except, or except I have the hope of Jesus Christ, which is what he's building to this morning. So he says this, this response of holiness is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. Godlessness is a lack of reverence. So godlessness can be best described as a heart condition. I don't acknowledge God with my heart that he is God. I choose to go a different direction. Wickedness is more the work of our hands. That's more doing, doing sinful acts. And so that, that kind of sums it up, doesn't it? God's heart is broken for those who choose to live as if he is not God and choose to engage in actions as if they have no consequences. And it says that they do that who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The reality is God, <laughs> this is a deep theological statement, you ready? God is God. I mean, that's the point of this morning. God is God. And he is true. And we cannot do anything to change that. But in our wicked hearts that choose to, to say there is no God, in our wicked hands which choose to go after the things that are not of God, somehow we think we are Pushing his truth aside for a new one. This doesn't mean that, that godlessness and wickedness somehow overcomes God's truth. It's people pretend like it doesn't exist. I can't change that God is true, but I can choose to live as if I don't acknowledge that. Which is why he says, since what may be known about God is plain to them... Because God has made it plain to them. God is revealing his truth. He is making himself known and has made himself known. The verb there is a past tense verb. It's a completed act. God says, I have through, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So God says, I have revealed myself to humanity. I have given them the truth. You can see it everywhere you look to communicate my presence, my love, my truth, so that people are without excuse. Ultimately, to make an excuse is to shift the blame on someone else, right? I say, Hudson, did you clean your room? No. I told you to clean your room. Well, I didn't hear you. Well, you, you acknowledged me. You said, yeah, yeah, but, it, but I didn't hear you. You didn't say it. Drives me nuts. Right? Like the, the, the mind of a teenager is wired, and we are all there, I did it too, is, well, I didn't do it wrong, you did it wrong, right? And we don't have to be taught that. Go volunteer in the three-year-old class, right? You say, hey, don't do that. He, he did it, right? Like we, we are wired to deflect Blame and shame and being wrong. And God says, I have revealed myself as a standard of truth so that no one can say, oh, I didn't know. Oh, you didn't, you didn't tell me that. Oh, I didn't hear. 
that mankind is without excuse. But because we tend to live in excuse, and it's easy to read this section of of Romans and think that God is just talking about people who don't know Jesus. But the reality is, just because I know Jesus, just because I have been justified, I continue to make these choices as well. Like, just because we know Christ doesn't mean sometimes we don't pretend like he doesn't exist. Just because we know Jesus doesn't mean that sometimes I don't acknowledge that God's truth is real. So all of us are here. So he gives this big picture that basically mankind refuses to acknowledge God. And then he gets specific. And that's what we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks are these specific. And I love the way that, that Paul writes these exchanges. He says, When we do these things, we exchange something for something, okay? We all just got through Christmas. I bet every single person in this room had to exchange at least one thing, right? And we exchange things sometimes because of the wrong size or the wrong color. Sometimes we just don't like them, right? Like we live in a society that, that, sure, if I don't like this, then I'll just go do this. And when it comes to God, we live in a world that says, well, if I don't like that, I'm just going to go do this. And so he lists these exchanges that build one on another. Verse 21, he says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Don't miss this. The people that he's talking about here knew God, but they didn't know God. Well, they knew about God. They were aware of God. But that doesn't lead to repentance. That doesn't lead to righteousness. What leads to repentance and righteousness is recognizing who God is. That is to glorify him, to give him his proper place, and to give thanks to him to realize who we are and our need for a Savior. That's when head knowledge becomes heart knowledge. That's when knowing about God turns to knowing God. When I recognize who he is and I am grateful for what he's done in my life. And so Paul says, they knew God. But they didn't recognize him for who he was. Or understand their need for him. Instead, in their thinking became foolish and their foolish uh, futile and their foolish hearts were darkened they had the opportunity to embrace to to pursue god and instead chose to go their own way which paul describes as futile and foolish but the problem is is that when we choose to reject god more than often What we're saying is, I'm smarter than God. I know better than God does, right? So we claim to be wise in that. But we become fools. The story of our world right now is a bunch of people that think they know better than God. And they're saying how smart they are because they're learning all these things about who people are and how the world works and all these things. But the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. We've never, I I say that, probably every generation has thought this. But we've never lived in a generation of dumber, smart people. Because we have all these people who claim to be so knowledgeable about everything, but they reject the one thing that matters. The glorification and thanksgiving of God. And so that you, that's, you see the dangerous road here because you don't, can't even see that you're a fool because you think you're so smart. And what we do then 
And here's the first exchange. The only one we're going to look at this morning. Exchange the glory of God, of the immortal God, for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. So what Paul is saying is we have the glory of God, the immortal God, at our disposal. And instead, we send that back, we reject it, and we embrace glorifying things we can control. Other people, animals, but basically ourselves. We reject the immortal and we elevate the mortal. That's the first exchange that sin is. It's choosing to ignore God and live as if this is all there is. And it goes back, and this is why I love this, this section of scripture so much, because it, it just, it's so deep theologically, but it ties back to the Ten Commandments. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. I love how specific this passage is, right? Because we're dumb. And so God says, I don't want you to make an image of anything in heaven or on earth or below the water. You will not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of their parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. That's a, I don't, I don't have time to, un, that's a whole sermon unto itself, the idea of generational sin. But for this morning, let me give you the one word, let me give you the, well, two sentence version of that, right? If I choose to sin, that is on me. However, if I choose to sin, I am also teaching the next generation in my home what sin looks like and how to glorify it. And then they teach the next generation. And so what he's saying there is, if you're worshiping the idols of this world, guaranteed that's going to that's gonna just seep down from generation to generation. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. God says, I am faithful. But I need your faithfulness. These people knew, but they did not change. They knew, but they rejected. They knew, but they went their own way. And instead of Instead of worshiping the image of God, and we've used that word many times. Um, it's icon in the Greek, right? It's, it's the perfect representation. Instead of, view, instead of worshiping that, we view, we worship frauds. Copies. Inferiors. I was uh, taking Mallory to orientation last April, and I had an afternoon to myself, um, and this is not my normal way to spend time. I'll just go ahead and tell you that, but uh, Yale has a big art museum, uh, so I was like, I got, I got time to kill, nowhere to go, so I'm going to go look in this art museum, and uh, I had no idea what it was. It was, it's apparently a pretty big art museum for college, and I'm up, and I'm walking down this row of paintings, and it's like, Oh, that was a Rembrandt. Oh, this is the Picasso. Oh, this is a Monet. Oh, this is a Manet. This is, I, there are a bunch of people I didn't have any idea who they were. I'm like, oh, that's pretty, right? But I'm sitting there and I'm looking at these paintings that I've seen in books or whatever, and, and it's a Rembrandt. And I'm thinking, well, number one, I'm standing here in front of a work of art that's worth who knows how much. Or am I? Because how easy would it be for people to say that they have one, but this not be the real one, right? Like, um, you know, like national treasure movies. Like, this is the Declaration of Independence, but no, it's really not, right? Like, like, is this really the real thing that Picasso touched, or is it close? That's my skeptical mind, right? And it 
that jumped back to me this week because really, when it comes to sin, we know that we have the work of the master right here in front of us. But instead of turning and looking at that and being enamored by its beauty and wonder, we turn over here and look at not just a poor copy, but like a finger painting of the work of the master. And somehow, some way, we look at that finger painting and we're like, man, that's awesome. Looks just like the original. Right? I mean, I could, I could right now go to my office with uh, some, some matte pencils and I could sketch you out something that just looks like, just like the Mona Lisa. No, I couldn't. But that's what sin is like. It's like I draw the Mona Lisa with crayons and then I put it on my wall and I'm like, that is it. That's what I want to look at all the time. And God's over here going, oh, no, 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 this is the masterpiece. This was painted by my hands. This is, this is designed to bring, to bring me glory and to fulfill you and to bring purpose to your life. And I'm like, no, thanks. This crayon drawing that I did is just as good. That's the exchange here. And you would think that after the Israelites saw all the idolatry that was around them all the time and then God brought them to the promised land, it would never have been a problem again. But in the time of Isaiah, he talks about a guy, he's like he cuts down a tree, just one of the trees in the forest. It is used as fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread, but he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half the wood he burns in the fire over the, it he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, ah, I am warm. I see the fire. From the rest he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, save me, you are my god. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over and they cannot see. And their minds are closed and they cannot understand. Clicker issues. No one stops to think. No one has had the knowledge or understanding to say half of it I used for fuel. I even baked bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? I love, that's to me the, the clearest passage on idolatry in all of Scripture. Isaiah says, God goes out in the forest, cuts down a tree, chops up the logs. Over here he builds a fire. He bakes bread. He warms himself. Same tree, same logs. Over here he carves an idol. On one side over here, he's like, this is useful. And on the other side, he's like, now you're my God. And that could be anything in our world. Anything. Name the temptation. Name the sin. Name sometimes even the good thing. And we, can, we have it over here and it's fine. But then we take it over here and we worship it. And it makes no sense. The prophet Habakkuk says, of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. Idolatry at its heart is not crafting a golden cow and putting it on your mantle and saying that is God. Idolatry at its heart is the person who trusts in his own creation more than the creator. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to the wood, come to life. Or to the lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. We're, attra 
attracted to the things of this world because they're tangible. They convey presence. And we worship a God who can't be defined. Even when God was before the Israelites in the fire, there was no form there. There was no, no something they could carve and say, oh, we know exactly what God looks like. God says, watch yourself very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman or an animal on earth or a bird that flies in the air or a creature that moves along the ground or a fish in the water. I love that God knows how dumb we are. Right? Don't make an idol, he says. Don't make it a man. Don't make it a woman. Don't make it a bird. Don't make it a cow. Don't make it a snake. Don't make it a fish. Don't make it whatever else you can think of. Let me be specific, God says. Just in case you look for a loophole. Because you know what? We look for loopholes all the time. Well, God said this, but he didn't mean it. All right, that's the original lie. God said don't eat from that tree, but he didn't mean it. He just knows if you, if you eat from that tree, you'll like it. And when you look up in the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them. And worshiping things the Lord your God is apportioned to all the nations under heaven. But as for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace out of Egypt to the power of his inheritance, or to, the peop- to be the people of his inheritance as you now are. Ooh, let that verse sink in, right? God says to the Israelites, I rescued you from the fires of Egypt to be the people of my inheritance. And you could take that verse and move it to Romans right now. And Paul could say, God rescued you from the iron smelting fire fire of sin and death and hell to be a people of his inheritance. And because God knew that we needed to see him, because he knew the way our hearts are wired, he came to us in that perfect icon, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. It's as if God said, I know. I know what you might wander after. You might wander after things I created, so let me send to you the firstborn over all creation. You might wander after people or things or buildings, so let me send you the head of the body, the church. Let me send you the first and the last so that you can see me and know me and not long for anything else. This is a serious thing for us because God says, I'm a jealous God. Now, Jealousy, again, is like, kind of like wrath, an emotion that we go, oh, wait, God's not jealous. Well, he said he is. But not jealous in the way that we get jealous. Jealous in the pure way of someone who loves deeply and longs for nothing to get in the way of that. Ultimately, this first exchange is a sovereignty issue. It's saying that God is God. I've I've read this quote before, but I'll read it again this morning. It's by A.W. Pink. The sovereignty of God is the supremacy of God, the kingship of God, the godhood of God. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that God is God. To say that he is sovereign is to declare that he is the most high, doing according to his will in the army of heaven among the inhabitants of the earth so that none can stay his hand or say to him, what are you doing? 
To declare God is God is to declare that he is almighty and does whatever pleases him. To declare God is God is to say that he is ruler over all the nations. To say God is God is to say that he is king of kings and lord of lords. And all that is beautiful and poetic, but what does it mean? It means that I don't get to tell God who he is. God tells me who he is. He is sovereign over the universe, over my salvation, over my suffering, and my global mission. And I don't need a picture that limits his power or a carving that indicates his presence or an explanation that gives him authority. He is God. And me declaring that he is God doesn't make him God. He is already God. I don't worship him today because I have decided that he is God. Sometimes I think we get the cart before the horse and we're like, well, I'm going to today declare that you are God. So what? I don't need to declare that he is God. I need to recognize he is God. It's to worship him as God. Not because I have decided that he is. And if I do that, then I come over here and I look at my crude crayon drawing of the Mona Lisa. And I go, well, that ain't right. Why does anybody want to look at this? I mean, that's bad. And if you've ever seen me, I I cannot draw. That's bad. But this... Well, this is perfect. It's beautiful. It it speaks to me at a depth and a level that what I can produce by my own hand can never do. And the reason is that this is the icon. And that's just foolishness that's the choice every day that we have every day I've been praying through this idea and where I tend to get overwhelmed is looking (laughs) too far backwards and too far forwards I look so far back that I see all of my sin and I don't remember who I am right now in Christ. And I look too far forward and I'm like, how can I never, ever, ever do any of this again? And then I get overwhelmed. And so what I've been praying and I, 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 I told you last week, I've got this book on prayer that's just phenomenal. We're going to do, do a book study together again this semester on Wednesday nights, and that's the book we're going to do. But um, what I've really been trying to pray through is this phrase, win the day. Win the day. I can't do anything today that's going to win the rest of my days. But I can today win the day. Today, I can choose to glorify God. Today, I can choose to give thanks to him. Today, I can look at these hand-drawn, cruddy pictures and see them for what they are. Or I can look at the master and see the work of his hand. And I don't have to worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough worry of its own, right? Right? But today, I can choose Jesus. Today. And then I can wake up tomorrow and choose it again. That's the heartbeat here that Paul has, I think. Not to make this, don't choose this, choose this and do it every day. That's to walk in the sovereignty of God. That is to walk in wisdom and not 
foolishness. That is to bring glory to God and not to the idols of this world. God, that you would help us see clearly.